Hi folks, today's tale starts 18th November 1914. The setting, Shimba Beris, the tallest mountain in Somaliland. A state often lumped in with Somalia in general, but they have their own self-determination and they were damn well going to keep it that way, regardless of what the British, Italians or Ethiopians had to say on the matter. Our hero tells us the Karif, a quote, hot labouring wind heavy with sand, end quote, was in full force. But up in the hills, the air was quite pleasant. All the same, he was at the head of a group of soldiers sent up to capture Shimberberis, up the steep, rocky hills of little more than a few shrubs to cover their ascent. Since 1899, the British had Somaliland in their sights, and had been a war with local dervishes, led by a man they called the Mad Mullah. The sources point out Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, a Sufi poet turned freedom fighter, turned general, was neither mad nor a mullah, but a man who was willing to stand up for his people for decade after decade, because he believed their way of life was worth defending. A hero himself writes somewhat respectfully of them, and expresses regret that they finally lost out to the invaders when they brought planes in, in 1920. The job for him and his men today, though, was to take over a stone blockhouse which looks out over the valley thus making it harder for the Mullah's soldiers to launch guerrilla attacks on the soldiers below. As they got closer, within 400 yards of the building, the dervishes from inside the blockhouse began taking pot shots of the British. The shots fell way short, and from how our hero describes the scene, particularly that they were mixing their powder low to conserve resources, I presume the dervishes may have been firing with muskets rather than rifles. The British fire back of a stone building, the dervishes return fire with cutting comments on the British soldiers' parentage. Our hero turns to his commander, Lord Ismay, and begs to be the one to charge the defences. All we have to do is cover 400 yards, make a three-foot jump across a deep embankment, then in the front door. Once we breach the front door, it's all over for them. Ismay lets his eager second in charge lead the assault. Our hero, Adrian Carton de Weert, would write years later how they charged the enemy, returning a volley of bullets with their own volley, how they were quickly up the hill and within feet of the target, when he catches a bullet to the face, to quote. By this time I was seething with excitement. I got a glancing blow in my eye, but I was too wound up to stop. I had to go on trying to get in, end quote. Following the bullet to the eye, Adrian Carton de Weert gets hit with a ricochet, striking him in the elbow. Frenetically, he returns fire. Another bullet hits him, this time glancing along the side of his head and going through his ear. A hero steps back from the melee, long enough to have his ear sewed back up, and then he rejoins the fray. This time a second bullet ricochets, catching him again in his damaged eye. So close to his target, yet so far. Adrian Carton de Weert is taken away from the front line. His men relieved for a while by an Indian battalion, who similarly just cannot make their way to that front door, and eventually they have to give up. The next day they ascend Shimberberis, only to find the dervishes have scarpered. While I'd like to imagine, to the defenders, this experience birthed tales of some noble defence akin to the siege of Saragathai or Rourke's Drift. Truthfully, Adrian Carton de Weert was not the only man to lose some body parts that day. These defenders for their gallant defence were in fact castrated later on. Truthfully, the Mad Muller did not look terribly well on him. Story has it they were castrated for not defending quite well enough. While we do have that little tidbit, what we certainly do have is a very clear story about this from the other side. From uh, a chapter in the life of the unkillable Adrian Carton de Weert. Often his tale was of insane misadventure when compared to, say, Mad Jack Churchill or Audie Murphy. But it's far too crazy a tale, too noble a tale in some respects, not to tell. Welcome, folks, to Tales of History and Imagination, Season 1, Episode 7, The Unstoppable, Adrian Carton de Weert. <laughs>
Adrian Carton de Wiert was a lifelong professional soldier who saw action in many, many theatres of war. He served for many years as a British officer, spent some of his time as a mercenary in the employ of Poland, and then returned to the British when World War II broke out. His career spanned from the Second Boer War of 1899 till just after World War II ended, all the way in 1947. You just don't see that kind of longevity, and normally when you do, like in the case of Baron Edmund Ironside, the model for novelist John Buchan's Richard Hannay, well, his short stint in World War II was a desk job. Another thing which makes Adrian Carton de Wiert so remarkable is the number of scrapes he survived, and the number of serious injuries he shook off. At least 11 serious gunshot wounds, including multiple shots to the head over two separate occasions. Shots to the stomach, leg, groin, hand, and ankle. He survived two plane crashes, being shot at by planes while driving at dangerous speeds along country roads. Survived trenches, revolutions, and mad mullahs. Dug his way out of a prisoner of war camp, single-handed, at an age when many would be collecting their pensions. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's cover a little early biographical information. Lieutenant General Sir Adrian Carden de Wiert was born, 5th of May 1880, to an aristocratic Belgian family in Brussels. Whether true or not, there was a rumour he was the illegitimate son of King Leopold II. Regardless of this, his father and his family were noteworthy, his father Leon being a well-to-do international lawyer. He grew up in Belgium, moving to Egypt after the death of his mother Ernestine, then on to private schooling in Britain, first a posh prep school, then Oxford University's Balliol College, to study law. While he enjoyed the company at Oxford, he was a terrible student, and in 1899 seized upon the Second Boer War in South Africa as a means of escape. At this point he was still a year too young to enlist, and being a Belgian citizen, his mother was part Irish, being the only real tie to the country. He was ineligible to serve for the British. So he changed his surname to Carton, got hold of some fake documents, and enlisted under the phony details. Adrian started at the bottom of a rung in Paget's Horse Yeomanry Regiment, where he fell in love with soldiering. His stories in South Africa at the time, however, are nothing special. Not long after arriving and acclimatising, and before he'd seen any significant action, he was ambushed by a couple of Boer soldiers while crossing a river. He was shot in the stomach and groin and sent home. His dishonesty was uncovered and his father, Leon, was furious at Adrian for enlisting. Once recovered, he would beg his father to allow him to re-enlist. He was just wasting his time at Oxford after all, and he'd found his niche in the army. Leon relented, and Adrian Carton de Wiert became a naturalised British citizen and re-enlisted, being sent back to South Africa with the Imperial Light Horse Brigade. The remainder of his time would consist of drudgery, next to no action, a lot of aimless wandering from one post to another. In 1902 he took his first commission as an officer and tried to get himself sent to Somaliland, but got sent to India to serve with the 4th Dragoon Guards. Most of his next 12 years are more or less free of conflict. And full of sports, hunting, a lot of killing animals for sport, a lot of the kind of hijinks you'd imagine when talking of upper crust Brits and the use of word hijinks, really. Drinking, gambling, party tricks. In 1904, he was sent to Pretoria for more of the same. Absolutely loved playing polo there. In 1908, he returned to Britain and only decided to look for an overseas posting when, on 3rd of January 1914, his father sent him the message that he'd gone bust playing the stock market and the allowance that he'd gotten so used to that he used to prop up his gambling, his horses, his sports, his hijinks, would cease immediately. Needing more money, Adrian signed up to fight in Somaliland, not knowing World War I was only around the corner. Something which did make him sad to hear, for now he was trapped in an obscure country on the Horn of Africa, fighting in a sideshow to the sideshow, while all the big action was going on on the continent. Now, back to the aftermath of Shimba Barris, where Adrian had been shot, technically twice, in the left eye. The field surgeons could do nothing for him, and sent him to Egypt. The Egyptian doctors wanted to remove his eye, but Adrian refused. He had a reason for doing this. Now, while his autobiography does give an indication that he was far more upset about this twist in the tale than most articles do, he did in fact know that if it was fixed up in Egypt, he would be sent back to Somaliland. 
If he was sent to London, however, he would be if he was found fit for duty after the surgery, sent to Europe to fight in the main event. Back in England, his eye was removed. He was declared fit for service so long as he wore an eyeglass. He didn't, by the way. And he was sent to France. Adrian Carton de Weert was redeployed in France and Belgium, where he saw action of the Battles of the Somme, Passchendaele, Cambrai, Second Battle of Ypres, sorry if I mispronounce, and Arras, amongst others. In February 1915, he set sail for France with his own infantry battalion, later on going on to command a whole brigade. Adrian Carton de Weert would win much praise for his soldiering and leadership, and he would also pick up several more injuries. On arriving at the Second Battle of Ypres, his battalion was sent out to relieve a previous battalion. On getting to the site, he wandered ahead with a small group to meet the staff officer they were expecting there to lead him to the main battlefield, only to be greeted by a pile of dead, mostly German bodies. Out of nowhere, a volley of fire came their way. Carton de Weert catching a shot to the hand, which sent his watch flying out of shrapnel, embedding further into the wound, was laid low. His hand badly mangled, Carton de Weert got back to his feet and pursued his attackers. Probably quite shocked at his tenacity, his attackers ran off. He then turned around and headed back to base. The terms in which he describes his injuries are probably gory enough that it would get this podcast marked explicit, but I will say that he lost two fingers and a whole lot more besides his hand was an absolute mess. He was sent back to London to recuperate. Doctors trying for the rest of 1915 to save his hand, and removing a little bit more at a time as it went bad, eventually they just amputated the hand. And three weeks later, Adrian Carton de Weert was on a boat headed back to the continent. There is a tale that soon after returning and being posted to the Somme, Adrian Carton de Weert is called on to clear the Germans out of the village of La Boiselle in France. They had tried twice before, both times leading to a bloody defeat for the Allies. This was confirmed on their arrival by large piles of dead bodies in the middle of no man's land. In a particularly tough battle, three unit commanders were killed and things had taken a dire turn. Adrian Carden de Weert, through mere force of personality and tactical smarts, did take command of all three battalions, and rallied the troops, winning the battle. This was a very hard-won battle with many casualties, but it highlights why he was so highly regarded. Later in the Battle of the Somme, he was shot again through the skull and ankle. The head injury is particularly shocking. Sent out at night to capture a particularly dangerous wooded area, High Wood, named the Devil's Wood by some, Carden de Weert was surprised by a sudden attack from out of nowhere, to quote Carden de Weert. We were still moving up when suddenly I found myself flat on my face with the sensation that the whole back of my head had been blown off. Holmes, his servant, managed to get him to shelter where they sat the battle out before attempting to get medical help. He had been struck by a machine gun bullet at the back of the skull which had gone clean from one side of his head out the back of the other, managing to avoid everything necessary for life. This wound did not keep him off the battlefield for long. That night, though, he was one of the very few survivors of a botched attack. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, armistice was signed, and the First World War all but ended. Adrian Carton de Weert summed up his wartime experience simply, quote, Frankly, I had enjoyed the war, end quote. When I say the war was all but finished, in an effort to rearrange post-World War I Europe, several new conflicts did break out. Take Poland as an example. We'll take a quick break here and return to discuss the next chapter of the life of Adrian Carton de Weert. Hi all, so we left off at the end of the Great War. Adrian spent a little time on break in Belgium, catching up with his family, which included cousins Henry, a future Belgian Prime Minister, and Edmund, political secretary to King Leopold II. On getting back to his battalion, he found morale low, a big feeling of anti-climax was kicking in, with many of the soldiers feeling purposeless, redundant, more or less a little aimless. While many in the rank and file could not wait to get home, Adrian was desperate for some more action. His opportunity arose when the war office called him to offer him the second in charge role to General Botha in the British military mission to Poland. For over a century and a half, the Polish-Lithuanian alliance had been broken up, and ruled over by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, 
the states which would go on to become Germany and the Russian Empire. With all three and different states of disrepair, Poland was now free to pursue its own statehood again, and with the Treaty of Versailles granting them nationhood again, pursue it they did. Were they to survive and keep their nationhood, Poland would have five more wars to fight, with the Soviet Russians who were fighting at the time to establish the USSR, with the Lithuanians, Ukrainians, the Czechs, and believe it or not, the recently defeated Germans. The defence of Poland, and at times the expansionist aims of Poland, was to become Adrian's next posting. So Adrian Carden de Weert was sent to Poland, originally as a second in charge. But when General Botha became unwell, he became the head of a delegation. Though serving for the most part as an advisor to the Poles and a liaison to the UK, he got himself physically involved in the Polish-Soviet War, Polish-Ukrainian War, the Polish-Lithuanian War, and skirmishes on the border of Czechoslovakia. He found over time, while he had a good working relationship with Winston Churchill, his relationship with then Prime Minister David Lloyd George was strained, and they had a falling out over backing the Poles' claim on the eastern Galicia region. He states he also found the Poles difficult to work with at times. Primarily, they were unreasonable in their claims for land, and not at all diplomatic when the UK said that they would not back them on a land claim. In 1924, however, the Poles had completed the five wars, winning all the land they believed should fall under their governance. During this time, Adrian Carden de Weert helped repel a sneak attack from the Ukrainians, fought in a relentless gunfight with the Soviets at the gates of Warsaw, survived a plane crash, was almost claimed by another, where he discovered on the ground that he had come within six inches of being shot yet again by a ground-based soldier, and for a short time found himself captured in Lithuania. He was a second in a duel between two Polish officers, and he stole wagon loads of guns from Hungary. In 1924, having retired from the British Army, he took advantage of his close ties to Marshal Pilsudski, the Polish leader, and Prince Karol Mikolaj Radziwill, again, apologies for pronunciations, hereafter referred to as Prince Charles, as that's what Adrian refers to him as himself and he got placed on a large estate in the Pripyat Marches, now situated between Ukraine and Belarus, on what was then recently reclaimed land. Now, Adrian doesn't mention what it was specifically which led to him stepping down from the British Army, other than to say that he had a falling out. He does recall that soon after his resignation, he found himself in Egypt, arranging the passage of his stepmother back to the UK. She'd had a stroke which had left her unable to look after herself. And while over there, he was almost brought into another conflict. In November 1924, the Governor-General of Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, General Sir Lee Stack, was murdered, and rioting broke out, while Carton de Weert was still in the country. He offered his assistance in resuming control, but equilibrium was soon restored before he was needed. While there, however, Adrian Carton de Weert was offered the command of a cavalry brigade, in Sialkot, modern-day Pakistan, he did turn us down. One may suspect it was more of a pull factor of the marshes than any push factor, to be honest. Carden de Weert goes to great length to explain how he first visited the stately home, surrounded by a half million acres, run down and neglected but being brought back to life by Prince Charles. Adrian goes on to explain how Prince Charles offered him a hunting lodge out on an island 40 kilometres from the Grand House. Adrian asked how much did he want for the rent. Charles said nothing, it's yours to keep if you want it. He did, and for the most part stayed there until the next great war. He goes on to detail how he spent much time hunting, killing 20,000 ducks in this time. He talks of the dinners and the company of the prince and his entourage on many nights. Of Nima Jeski, again pronunciation, apologies if I get that wrong. A local scoundrel he became friends with or of the bandits that were afraid of him, and of finding a love of reading of the hunting lodge. Of the often quiet nights, he wrote, It was a lonely place, but I never felt the loneliness, for the countryside had so much to give, everything, in fact, I had ever wanted. End quote. The splendid isolation would soon be disturbed, however. On 30th of September, 1938, shockwaves from British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's Munich Agreement with Adolf Hitler supposed to bring peace in our time, were felt in Poland. Adrian contacted British Army head Viscount Gort, offering his services, if needed. But at this time he was given a cold shoulder. 
In April 1939, Adolf Hitler withdrew Germany from the German-Polish Non-Aggression Pact of 1934 and the London Naval Agreement, a treaty which was aimed to stop the naval arms race building between Germany like it had in World War I. Hitler began demanding Poland hand over the free port of Danzig, a mostly ethnic German city in the north of Poland, and a land corridor to access to the city. In July, Adrian Carton de Wiert is called back to the war office and offered his old job back, as head of a British military mission to Poland. He happily signs up for the role. On August 22, 1939, he gets a message to head to Warsaw immediately. He borrows Prince Charles's car and is advised by his superiors that another war is only days away. Two days later, he was in a meeting with the Polish commander-in-chief, Marshal Edward Rij Smigel. Carden de Wiert's advice to attack the Germans as soon as they crossed the border fell on deaf ears. He also suggested getting the Polish navy out of the Baltic in case they were captured, which uh, Rij Smigel grudgingly accepted. On the 1st of September, the Nazis attacked, taking out the airfields within hours and steamrolling through town after town. On the 1st, the Nazis bombed Warsaw. Adrian Carton de Wiert, still in the city, later commented on the bombings, quote, With the first deliberate bombing of civilians, I saw the very face of war change. Bereft of romance, its glory shone, no longer the soldier setting forth into battle, but the women and children buried under it, End quote. On the fifth day of the invasion, the embassy made the decision to clear out and get to safety, and Adrian Carton de Wiert was put in charge of getting everybody out. This initially meant getting back into Polish-held territory, at times frantically dodging aerial assaults. At one point, a Mrs. Shelley, the wife of one of the diplomats, was killed by a strafing plane. But at a certain point, the USSR having entered the invasion of Poland by the 17th of September, they found themselves 15 miles from the border with Romania. Adrian Kahn de Wiert approached Marshal Rij Smigel, stating if the Marshal was to stay and fight, he would too. Reed Smigel made the decision to make the final dash across the border into Romania. FYI, the two countries don't share a land border now. They did in the southeast in 1939. Obviously, the maps have changed since. Finding Romania, at the time officially on the side of the Allies, but with revolution in the air, they flew out of Romania for Britain under false identities, 21st of September 1939. Just as their plane was leaving, the pro-British Prime Minister Armin Kalinescu was assassinated, and the Romanian fascist Iron Guard Party took control of the country. On returning back to Britain, he discovered the Russians, on getting involved, went straight for his hunting lodge to capture him, and was surprised to hear he'd already left for the war. In April 1940, Carden de Wiert was redeployed, in charge of a joint French-British force headed into Norway to invade Trondheim, and stop the Nazis from pushing any further into Norwegian territory, which would have made a good launch pad to attack Britain from. He had to leave his newly acquired 61st Division that he had been training up for the war. Having arrived and set up near the Namsen River, Carden de Wiert was struck at how indefensible the area was, unless held by highly specialised soldiers. The soldiers were to attack Trondheim as soon as the Allies brought in a fleet to attack from the sea. Unfortunately, before they could get prepared, the French troops drew attention to themselves from the Nazis, drawing a German bombardment. The Nazis showed up with ships and planes before the Allied Expeditionary Force could get themselves set up, before the British naval attack, and they began shelling the city. Though they did their best to dig in, it was hopeless, to quote Carton de Wiert. We had rifles, a few Bren guns, and some two-inch smoke bombs, but none of them were either comforting or effective against the destroyer. They dug in at a farmhouse outside of Trondheim and waited for a chance to evacuate, as it was clear the mission had failed. Eventually, Lord Mountbatten's ships managed to break through and rescue him. One ship, the French destroyer Afridi, was sunk in the escape. Adrian Carden de Weir comments he almost ended up on this ship, but for his gear being loaded onto the York and, presumably half-jokingly, states that he was robbed of the experience of a shipwreck. On the voyage home, Carden de Weert turned 60, the age one must retire from active military service. He was briefly put back in charge of his 61st Division, and put in charge of the defence of Northern Ireland, 
but was soon called back due to his age, something he fought hard against and pointing out that he had, unlike his replacement, experience of crushing mechanised warfare deployed in World War II. His replacement, Lieutenant General Henry Pownall, had no idea what to expect. He would soon be redeployed on a diplomatic mission, however, to provide his expertise in Yugoslavia. While flying to the Balkans via a circuitous route, first stopping in Malta to refuel and then Egypt, the plane's engines failed, and it crashed in the ocean off the coast of Libya. Adrian Carton de Weert was knocked out on impact, and came to as he was pushed out of the sinking plane. Without a dinghy, well they had one, but it had sprung a leak. They had to hang on to wreckage from the plane, till the wreckage began to sink. They then swam for the shore. As soon as they were on land, they were shadowed by Italian police officers, who just hung round till some soldiers came to take them away. Adrian Carden de Weert was taken to a prisoner of war camp in Italy, where he would remain from 1941 to 1943. Held captive with a number of other Allied senior officers of the Villa Medici, Abruzzo, Carden de Weert planned and made numerous attempts to escape, at one point spending seven months digging a tunnel under the camp. He escaped via tunnel just days before an order came to release him and send him back out to Britain. On the run, with his missing hand, his eye patch, not a word of Italian, he still managed to hide among the locals for eight days before being found. He talks of his time in captivity as being relatively comfortable, and that the Italian soldiers detaining him treated him and the other officers well on the whole. He does make mention of a camp supervisor called Viviani, who he wished he could run into again into, quote, more equal circumstances, end quote, but seems for the most part to have gotten on with his captors. He mentions the prison as not far from Terminilio, a mountaintop base where Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator, would later be imprisoned by the Italians themselves and rescued by the Nazis. Just putting this out there, at some point I will have to come back to that story and Mussolini's rescuer, Otto Scorzani, perhaps the most dangerous man in Europe in this time. In August 1943, the Italians released Adrian Carton de Weert, in part owing to his age and missing body parts, in part due to his rank, and then Italy, who were on the verge of calling it a day on World War II, wanted to send a diplomat back with him to discuss with the British just what they were going to do with the Allied prisoners of war in Italy. He was returned to the British via neutral Portugal. Adrian Carton de Weert, once home, was kept under wraps until 7th of December 1943, when Italy formally surrendered. Once his presence in the UK was revealed, many people thought he had something to do with the Italian surrender, and Carton de Weert began to get inundated with letters from families, asking questions he couldn't answer about the whereabouts of their captured family members. After a few weeks back, Adrian Carton de Weert began to wonder what next still hoping to be deployed back in Yugoslavia. Carden de Weert did not have too long to wait until his next assignment. Prime Minister Winston Churchill sent him as his personal representative to China. He would travel there via Cairo, where he sat in the top brass meeting. There's a group picture of Churchill or Roosevelt, Chiang Kai-shek, surrounded by various generals, Carden de Weert amongst them, then on to India, then China. This role was a desk job, to report any news back from India, China, or Burma, straight back to Churchill. While there, however, he appears to have enjoyed living amongst the Chinese. He was also offered a combat role by Kuomintang leader Chiang Kai-shek, but he did turn the role down. Much of his recollections of his time in China, he shares tales of the people and of the progress of World War II, right down to its conclusion. He does mention he had very little to do with the communists, except for at one point he did give Chairman Mao a piece of his mind. He clearly was no fan of communism, this being one of the very few times he speaks ill of another group of people. He would get to fly to Singapore to take part in the Japanese surrender. Preparing to return to Britain, he did feel a bit of a diffidence, an awkwardness and an unsureness that he really didn't know what to find there. Churchill's successor, Clement Attlee, asked him to stay on as his eyes and ears for a bit longer which Adrian Carden de Weert would do, till a fall down a flight of stairs in Rangoon in 1947 forced him into retirement. In the fall, he broke his back, narrowly avoiding paralysis. It would take him several months to fully recover. He was 66 years old at retirement, having survived 11 major gunshot wounds, two plane crashes, both world wars, the Boer War, action in four of Poland's five post-World War I wars with its neighbours. Numerous battles, detainment, 
He'd seen Warcraft progress from fighting on horseback to the dropping of the atomic bombs. Now, I haven't said much about his family life. In 1949, his first wife died, and yes, he was married, to an Austrian countess, no less. And he also had two daughters. He never actually mentions his family once in his autobiography, Happy Odyssey. I do wonder, though, if he did think the Countess of Penelope to his Odysseus. In 1951, he remarried to a woman 23 years his junior by the name of Joan Sutherland, and settled down to a genteel life, though continuing to hunt and fish in County Cork, Ireland. He died in 1963, aged 83. A quick final thought on Adrian Carton de Weert. I first come across his tale while lying in a hospital bed in Phuket in 2014. My dad came in with a suggestion to keep my brain active while I recuperated. Google up this general card and weird, the story is crazy. It is, and I think from the first readings I had him pegged as some real-life Terminator. Someone like Anton Chigurh in No Country for Old Men. I originally saw myself ending this piece with a quote from the man himself. Governments may think and say what they like, but force cannot be eliminated, and it is the only real and unanswerable power. We are told that the pen is mightier than the sword, but I know which of these weapons I would choose. End quote. I think this sums him up to a degree, but I also came away with a sense of Adrian Carton de Weert from his autobiography as an honourable man, open minded, respectful to most, strangely introspective. Anything but a raconteur, really. Very much the adventurer, but not a braggart. Never relishing in tales of his bloodshed. Rarely looking on his enemy with cruelty or malice. I came to this episode with the concept he was a stereotypical rough man, standing ready, doing the things we dare not ourselves so we can sleep safe in bed. I think this is still true, but I understand what the rough man is less than I thought I did. I think I leave this little project with a much greater impression of him, but ultimately understanding him less than I thought I did too. All I can say is, as much as I don't tell a lot of war stories, I have become a fan of Adrian Garden de Weert. Okay, that is us for the week. Um, as per usual, we will be back in two weeks' time. Please uh, drop us a line. We will be back in about a fortnight with something very different again. As always, music by Ishtar. Thank you for tuning in. We will be back again for more tales of history and imagination. <laughs>